welcome to Ridgeview Middle School. Thank you for those of you joining us on County Cable Montgomery. I'm Sonia Burke, and we're at a community meeting to discuss a proposal to install small cell antennas in residential communities across Montgomery County. The the purpose of this meeting is for residents here to get their questions answered about pending applications and about proposed and existing regulations. We have several county council members in the audience tonight, including council president Nancy Florine, who's going to make some opening remarks and introduce us to the other council members. Thank you. Uh, thanks everyone for coming out. It's a great turnout. I know there's a lot of interest in this. Um, I know there are many questions, and I hope you can get them answered and, and get your concerns on the table. We've heard from many of you for quite a while. Um, I do want to share with you the reason we're having this conversation in the first place. Uh, what we know is, and I think the charts back there reflect that, we have about 200 plus applications filed for these uh, small, t small cell towers or devices, whatever you want to call them, on shorter p short poles. Um, our zoning law right now requires a 300-foot setback from, from um, poles because it was put into place to address applications for poles of 100 to 200 plus feet, the big ones, and you've seen them, big debates in communities throughout the county periodically. The challenge that we have is what do we do? Because those rules apply to bigger poles. If we do nothing, we run the risk that there'll be, we won't, they, the current applications will all be denied. Well, you might be happy with that at the get-go. The challenge is, and we don't know for sure, there's a chance that that uh, issue could be overturned and all, those, uh, all the pending applications could then go into effect. That's our challenge. It, and what I don't want you to be in a situation with where is a, is a, uh, seeing all these polls go in without any criteria at all for their location. So that's the challenge. If we don't, don't do anything, we'll see what happens. We're likely to get uh, preempted by the federal government. Um, and it's a lot of polls, and it's a real challenge. So we're trying to identify some criteria where, whereby some of them could be to go forward, and then others might not be able to go forward, but at least there'd be a system for addressing them. Right now, we don't have one, and that is the challenge that we face. Uh, I think having a process in place is better than not having a process in place. Um, the jury may be out. We shall see. Uh, but the real issue is how do we protect community interests in this regard? That really is the issue that's before us right now. We have a panel of experts here, or at least people involved in the industry, and the st our staff on the county who process this stuff to share with you some of the details of what they're facing, what their issues are, and then, of course, what's most important is to hear from you all. Uh, and before we get into all that, let me introduce my colleagues here who are here. There's uh, Council Member Sidney Katz and Council Member at Large George Leventhal. Mr. Katz, you want to say a word? Well, thank you very much. I'm not going to repeat what Nancy said, but I do want to make it known that we are very, very concerned about this. Obviously, there's people in this room who have the same concerns that we do, and we're going to have to work through this. I also wanted to note that the municipalities, both Rockville and Gaithersburg, are not covered by this legislation. They would not be. They could, they could you know, uh, link on to it if they so desired, but they are not necessarily covered by this legislation though they have, from what I've heard as a, in, in private discussions, is that they certainly are looking for, towards the county to see what we might come up with and whether or not that would be something that they could come up with as well. But we are here, we are concerned, we understand that, that people are saying these are small cell towers, well, they're not so small and they're in somebody's front yard, and people are saying, well, it's in the right-of-way, which it is, but you're cutting the grass in that right-of-way. It, it, it might not look like it's your yard, but of course it is. It, it, it's part of it. So we're, we're here for that very, very reason. I'm going to turn it over to George Leventhal. Hey, good evening, everyone. I'm George Leventhal. I work for you. I'm here because I want to get educated. This is a complex issue. I want to thank Council President Nancy Florine for organizing this meeting so that we can all get our question answered and learn the facts together. 
Um, Councilmember Florine introduced her legislation, and understandably, some community members said, why is the county council putting these towers in my neighborhood? Council President Florine has explained the county council doesn't put up towers. Council President Florine's legislation, which I've come to no conclusions on, I have not co-sponsored, as she explained, was intended to provide some protection to the community, particularly in the event that the FCC preempts whatever protection the local community tries to impose and just allows uh, whole-scale uh, installation of these towers. But I work for you. My job is to protect communities from undesirable impacts as much as we feasibly can, understanding uh, what laws we're governed by and what rights and what uh, powers we have. And uh, we're joined now by another county council colleague, Mr. Hans Reamer. Hi, everyone. I'm glad to be here tonight. It's a beautiful neighborhood. I drove through. through. Believe me, I noticed the light posts. Uh, you know, they're very attractive, and I understand what you're trying to uh, preserve. So, uh, you know, I get it. W we are faced with a big challenge here. We're going to learn tonight together. Uh, we've been doing a lot of research. I've been doing a lot of research and uh, really have appreciated the effective advocacy from the community representatives that I've been working closely with. And, uh, you know, we're going to work our way through this together and learn tonight. Thank you. Thank you. As Ms. Florine said, we have some representatives from the telecommunications companies involved in this issue up on our panel. We have some representatives from the county executive staff and some council staff. I'm going to just go through our panelists and announce who's here, and then we'll have some presentations. Um, from the council staff, we have Jeff Zines. From county executive's office, um, the program director of Ultra Montgomery, Mitzi Herrera. We have Marjorie Williams from the Office of Cable and Communication Services. Phil Hartman from Mobility, Kathy Borton from Verizon, and Edward Donahue from Crown Castle. And I'm sorry, sir, you didn't well, have a name tag. I'm Lee Applebach. I'm with the uh, engineer for the uh, county. OK, thank you, sir. Thank you. Um, we have a couple presentations from our panel. First, though, uh, Margie Williams has a few words to say. Ms. Williams? Uh, good evening. My name is Margie Williams. I am the chair of the Transmission Facilities Coordinating Group, better known as the Tower Committee here in Montgomery County. We are an in interagency engineering review committee that is made up of eight members, including landowning agencies and departments in the county government that review some aspect of the telecommunications application. In 1996, the Tower Committee was created to work with wireless service providers to create a process to coordinate, encourage co-location, prevent interference problems, and track wireless facilities in the county. The process here in Montgomery County is a national model. Many communities are looking to Montgomery County for guidance. In the past four months, we have received an unprecedented amount of applications. We've received almost 250 applications for new towers. That is more than we have received in the past 18 years combined. Please take a look at the charts that have been provided in the back. It shows where the locations possibly are, how many applications we have just gotten in the last four months, many, many things. But I hope that you find that they are helpful. Um, Mitzi Herrera took the time to create them uh, with some of our engineering staff. So we, we do feel like they show just, just what, we, what we're up against. Uh, when the telecommunications applications come into the county, the Tower Committee is the first um, group that reviews them. Basically, we receive applications for modifications. Those are modifications to existing structures in the county. We receive co-location applications. That's when a carrier would like to co-locate on an existing facility, whether it's a building, another monopole, whatever, and then the new towers. So what we're really here to talk tonight about are really these new, new towers. The applications are reviewed for the following criteria. We first review the applications for completeness and accuracy, whether the proposed antenna or support structure meets the zoning standards for the property on which it will be located. What impact, if any, will the proposed antenna and support structure have on existing and future county public safety telecommunications? What visual or other impacts will the proposed antenna or support structure have on the surrounding area? Potential radio frequency conflicts for attachment of new facilities at the site. Whether there are existing structures to which antennas could be attached to meet the target service objective of the provider in lieu of a new monopole or tower. 
whether the proposed height is necessary, whether the structure is designed to accommodate at least two additional carriers, whether a stealth design might, might be better for the neighborhood, whether the site has sufficient ground space, whether the equ equipment will be screened, whether the carrier has identified this service area of a part of its master plan of proposed facilities. The Tower Committee either recommends, recommends with conditions, or does not recommend based on that criteria. The Tower Committee meets once a month on the first Wednesday of every month to review applications. We maintain a website that can be located at www.montgomerycounty.gov forward slash cable. Oh, thank you, thank you. Um, and then you click the link for the towers and antennas. I try to put out as much information as possible on there. If you have suggestions on things that you'd like on the website, we are always open. It's an open process. I'm, I'm happy to put out there anything that, you know, makes it easier for the communities. Um, and, you know, we are definitely here to, to work with everybody else. Um, my colleague Mitzi Herrera is going to give a little more information on, on the actual process here in the county. So, thank you, everyone, for coming. My name is Mitsuko Herrera. Uh, just wanted to quickly say that, as Margie mentioned, we are there. Some people have asked, what are other jurisdictions doing? Montgomery County has received 10 times as many applications as any other jurisdictions that we're seeing. So we are really at the forefront of what is going on. We are looking at other jurisdictions to see how they've handled matters of being paid to install facilities in the public rights of way, how they are handling leases to use county properties, uh, particularly street lights and poles and maintenance of that. Uh, and in the back of the room, what you'll also see is uh, there's an excerpt from there from the Federal Code uh, 47 U.S.C. 332. Those are mobile services. And the important things in there are that local governments may not enact statutes, statutes that either discriminate against different types of technologies or that have the effect of prohibiting the provision of personal wireless mobile services, and the FCC has jurisdiction to issue all regulations concerning RF emissions. So the county has no authority and is preempted by federal law from regulating on the basis of RF emissions. And if there's more questions, I'm happy to answer. Now we're gonna so, go oh, just quickly, RF means radio frequency. So some people have raised issues about the health concerns, about having wireless technology, and those types of things. There are studies and things that have been done, but the county does not have authority to regulate on the basis of those health, of those emissions. Thank you. Now we're gonna go to Mr. Donahue from Crown Castle, who has a presentation. Mr. Donahue. Thank you. Um, I'm the Government Relations Council for uh, Crown Castle. I brought Rich Rothrock. Rich is going to walk you through a PowerPoint presentation. While Rich is getting himself uh, set up, let me just mention that we brought several folks with us to try to, uh, in anticipation of some questions about um, site selection, construction, where you have uh, several folks uh, in the audience. So depending on the nature of the question, we're going to probably refer to the folks either from Crown or, or perhaps from um, Verizon uh, on RF engineering, et cetera. So let me ask Rich to come up and do, uh, I think that the uh, important thing with the PowerPoint is it does give us an opportunity to use some, some graphics and, and hopefully you'll find this very useful. Rich? Thank you, Ed. Uh, as Ed mentioned, uh, I do want to thank first and foremost Montgomery County for giving us the opportunity to come out and, and speak tonight and also thank you to the residents who have come out to, to hear what we have to say. Uh, we do have Ed Donahue to my right, who is our Government Relations Council. Uh, myself is Government Relations Manager for the Maryland, D.C. and Virginia market. I also have along with myself tonight, uh, J.D. McCluskey, who is our RF uh, Engineering Manager. I have Butch Salamone, who's our uh, Government Relations Specialist. And I have Michael Lott, who is our Implementation uh, Construction Project Manager. So before we get into some of the uh, specifics about Crown Castle and what we are looking to, uh, to deploy in Montgomery County, 
I wanted to just point out a couple uh, some a couple statistics that I think everybody would find very interesting. Uh, roughly 48% of the households today rely exclusively on their mobile devices for uh, means of communication. Uh, video is projected to be upwards of 75% of the mobile data usage by the year 2020. And today, as it stands, 70% of the 911 calls that are received from a municipality are from wireless devices. So some, some pretty interesting and, and staggering numbers considering uh, the amount of time that wireless has been part of our integral lives. Uh, moving to the next slide, just a little background on Crown Castle specifically. Crown Castle was established in 1994 and is headquartered in uh, Houston, Texas. Uh, we are uh, listed on the New York Stock Exchange and uh, part of the S&P 500. And as you can see, we have a, a pretty uh, substantial portfolio, which uh, really boils down to we are a stable partner that's here for the long haul. We have uh, intentions of uh, operating in Montgomery County and being a good partner with the county and the residents for, for years and years to come. Uh, moving to the next slide, uh, when we talk about DAS and small cell in general, just to give everybody an idea of what we are currently operating across the country, we have 18,000 small cell and DAS nodes deployed today uh, across the continental U.S. that is supported by uh, DAS, excuse me, is a distributed antenna system. Um, that is uh, supported by roughly 17,000 miles of fiber optic cable providing that fast uh, connectivity back to the, the central hub locations. Uh, so this is a technology that has existed for the last 10 or 15 years and is becoming more and more uh, predominant in the wireless industry. Uh, <laughs> moving to the next slide, uh, Crown Castle is a certified public utility. Uh, we are, uh, in fact, a utility in the majority of the, uh, the 50 states. I believe there's four that we are not a regulated utility in. Uh, however, we are operating today in the state of Maryland as a, as a regulated utility. <clears throat> Going back again and just uh, emphasizing some of the, the mobile data uh, and, and its projection for growth over the next uh, five to ten years. Uh, today, mobile devices uh, are about 447 million. Uh, that is expected to double from 2015 to 2020, so uh, exponential growth over the next five years. Uh, wearable devices that I'm sure we are all becoming uh, fastly uh, experienced and, and knowledgeable about, that's expected to grow 18 times over uh, the next five years. And then machine-to-machine -machine connections uh, is going to see exponential growth, growth excuse me, for, uh, for years to come. <clears throat> what does that mean to your community? What are the benefits that Crown Castle will, will provide to your community? Uh, first, improved emergency communications, access to voice, video, and data that helps first responders uh, perform more effectively and efficiently. Improved wireless service, improved accessibility to networks with better products and services for residents, businesses, and visitors to the community. Improved connectivity, constant and instant access to information anywhere at any time with faster internet download speeds. And lastly, improve personal health, safety, and security. Uh, enhance wireless networks that will enable uh, ongoing advances in telehealth and home security to be uh, supported. How does DAS work with the existing uh, macro sites that you may be familiar with today? So um, I'm sure most of us in the room have experienced uh, instances where we had difficulty connecting to a network or uh, we would look down at our device and we would see that we had multiple bars on our device but we weren't able to, to make the phone call or we weren't able to download the data that we were looking to download. And that's primarily due to congestion on the network. Um, it's not uh, necessarily an instance where we do not have coverage in an area. We simply can't handle the capacity or the volume of users that are trying to connect to that network. That's where DAS can come in and supplement and enhance that existing uh, wireless network and relieve that congestion. Um, <clears throat> moving to the next slide, uh, the right in infrastructure for your community. When we look at deploying a DAS network in your community, we uh, first and foremost, we're going to be looking to existing infrastructure that exists out in the right-of-way today. Uh, we, we take a three-tiered approach. The, the first uh, 
thing that we're looking for when we're selecting a location is existing utility infrastructure. So we're going to be targeting that, targeting that third-party utility infrastructure that exists today. Uh, when that uh, utility infrastructure is exhausted or is not available, then we'll look for other alternatives and other items that may exist in the right-of-way uh, for our attachment. And that's where Montgomery County's municipal infrastructure comes into play. Uh, and that's predominantly going to be that, uh, that lighting infrastructure that exists out there. And then lastly, if, if those two uh, types of connections or, or co-locations are unavailable to us, then we will look to, to plant new poles to, to fill in that coverage gap. Uh, the map that you see on the screen uh, is the two primary locations that Crown Castle has been contracted to provide uh, relief to that congested system. Uh, the, the northern polygon is the Father Hurley or the Germantown area of Montgomery County. The southern polygon is the North Potomac or South Gaithersburg uh, portion of the county. And those are two areas where uh, the wireless providers have indicated that they are struggling to meet the demands of the, uh, the consumers in the area. <clears throat> uh, the next slide shows an example of one of the uh, Montgomery County uh, pieces of infrastructure that we have, uh, have looked at as a possible means of uh, solving this uh, congestion problem. Uh, it's the traditional Cobra-style street light that I'm sure everybody's familiar with. Um, what we are proposing to do is to simply replace that existing structure with a like structure that is structurally capable of carrying the, the loading of the additional equipment. Uh, we're working very closely with Montgomery County DOT as well as the uh, State Highway Transportation Standards to make sure that we meet all of the structural and safety requirements that, uh, that we need to, uh, to make sure that we're addressing when we put structures in the right-of-way. The next style of uh, light that we have targeted is the traditional uh, colonial-style post-top light. Uh, in this instance, the light itself is, is relatively short and structurally incapable of carrying the proposed load. So in this instance, we would propose to replace the structure with a new structure that has additional height that would uh, enable the uh, structure to accommodate the addition of the antenna and the equipment while still serving the primary purpose, which is um, uh, residential lighting. The light would be reinstalled on the new pole at the same elevation that it exists today, but rather than being a post-hop mount, it would be a side mount. And lastly, just to, to reemphasize um, a little bit about Crown, we, ha we have been operating in the small cell and DAS arena for the last 15 years. We have deployed 18,000 of these small cell and DAS facilities across the country, uh, supported by over 17,000 miles of fiber optic cable. As we have one more presentation, and then we're going to open it up for questions. We're going to go to Paul Hartman with mobility. And talk to you a little bit about more about our company. Uh, many of you may not be familiar with mobility, uh, and a little bit more about our national deployment of our wireless solutions. Um, well, while that's loading up, uh, mobility is a is a uh, global provider of wireless solutions. Uh, our company funds, designs, builds, operates, and maintains our uh, wireless infrastructure facilities across the country. We currently are in the process of deploying a national network of over 70,000 facilities across the country. The objective of this network is to bring us into the next arena of data uh, deployment and data uh, connectivity. Uh, as our colleagues from Crown had pointed out, um, this is an emerging technology when we're talking about small cell technology and the ability to increase and densify our ability to provide data in high usage areas. Mobility provides a number of, of different solutions when it comes to data connectivity and voice. Uh, we have distributed antenna systems, we have small cell, we have Wi-Fi. We have done a number of projects across the country uh, focusing on specific venues. Uh, we have done the distributed antenna systems at uh, Churchill Downs. Uh, just think of 350,000 people in one day trying to use their phones, trying to place automatic bets, trying to take pictures, trying to, trying to share that information back out. That is an enormous amount of data needs for one central location. So our company has provided solutions to those data demand needs in specific locations, and now we are working on providing increased data 
connectivity nationwide. You know the next one? As referenced by my, my other colleagues here, data consumption is increasing on a daily basis. Um, just think back to what about two months ago now when Pokemon Go hit. Pokemon Go's data draw was the most significant data draw of anything that the industry had seen in recent times. So when you think about the connectivity that we've all become accustomed to and we are all attracted to, whether it be for our thermostats or be able to start our car or to be able to navigate even getting to this meeting this evening, we have become interconnected through our data connectivity. That consumption is only going to grow as we get smarter and develop more apps and develop more ways to use connectivity from driving cars to protecting our houses. So we need to find solutions to how we are going to provide both for our current needs and what we see in the next generation of iteration uses of devices connected to data. We touched on, you know, my colleagues touched on the dependency we have in terms of, of data usage and, and the need for increased deployment of facilities to, to provide that connectivity. We are in an era where data is key to not just our convenience, but also to our security. As, as was interested in a previous slide, we're looking now at communities that are looking at text 911. And how do we ensure that those types of things are going to be effective and be able to provide the emergency services that are necessary, that we rely on, that we rely on government to provide for us? So we are, as a company, uh, an opportunity to build out that infrastructure that's necessary to provide the connectivity that we are all coming to rely on. You can go to the next. When people say towers, when they say cell phones, when they say construction for telecommunications, this is what we traditionally think of. We think of the traditional tower that has multi-carriers on it, that has these large panels that are intrusive, they are uh, visual clutter, uh, and they have dotted our, our highways, they've, they've cropped up on buildings across the country. This is not the technology that we are talking about. This is technology that we are able, through the deployment of small cell technology, to begin to move away from. We have customers of ours that are now looking for the opportunity to get off of those large towers that you have all struggled with over the years on how to site them, uh, how to manage them, how to deal with you know, visual clutter, uh, how to, how to uh, essentially disguise those types of facilities whenever possible. We've all seen the, the Franken pines or the Franken trees. We, are, we have advanced the technology to the point where those are not the types of facilities that we, we talk about today. And we love the opportunity to come in tonight and show you on the next slide what these facilities are. You saw some of the, some of the uh, facilities that Crown had indicated. These are actual facilities that are in place. Uh, the one on the left uh, is an attachment in Los Angeles, California. And the one on the right is a, a single small cell pole that we have installed in Atlanta, Georgia. You can see that we have developed the technology to be able to provide the data connectivity in a fashion that is much less intrusive. It's streamlined. It is designed to deliver the maximum density capacity deployment while trying to mitigate the impact on communities. So this is current applications, you'll see different versions of it. You know, Crown talked a little bit about the, the attachments on existing facilities in terms of light poles uh, and other assets within the community. Mobility is looking at the same opportunities. We are looking to see where we can find existing uh, facilities to attach to, uh, to put equipment on that will provide the relay of that data information uh, without having to have too tremendous of an impact on the communities. Just a couple more simulations of, of facilities that uh, could be located in communities throughout Montgomery County. Uh, you'll see again the light pole uh, uh, 
version of the facility, you'll also see the traditional wooden uh, utility pole that has an antenna and a communications equipment placed up on the top of the pole. Our deployment is two-phased. We have the small cells that were, you had the opportunity to see just recently, uh, and then we also have what we call our transport facilities. These are two different types of structures. They, are, they do have two different purposes. The transport is exactly what it sounds like. It is the key component to communicate with the smaller small cells. So if you can think about it in one way, we have, if we look at, think of coverage, and you see all these maps on TV of all the different carriers that talk about their coverage and the dots and the, and the, the rings. Think about a large flashlight that you hold up. And when you hold that up high, you get large coverage, but you kind of get dispersed light. When you have small cells, you have smaller flashlights that, that go around that larger, that larger flashlight. So you're densifying the amount of light in a smaller region. The communications between that larger transport facility and those smaller small cells that are the relays of the data and the information in a concentrated area. So while you're walking down the street and you're following your Google Maps, you're able to go block by block by block and not lose the ability to know where you are in the neighborhood. That's the, the purpose of a small cell deployment, is to ensure that we have that connectivity that flows through a community, and our community right now is globally. We want to make sure that across the country, as you're driving down the highway, that data is going to follow you and you're going to be able to use your communications devices and anything else that's connected in your car, whether it be Pandora or anything else. We are a company that uses a wireless system. Uh, we are able to communicate between our transport facilities and our small cell facilities wirelessly. Now what's the benefit to that? We have less impact on the communities because we're not um, doing, going through street cutting and laying fiber. Uh, we have less visual clutter because we have less aerial connections between facilities. Um, the technology is more easily upgradable when it is above ground and attached to a single uh, pole structure. And it increases our connectivity amongst the system. So there are a lot of benefits to the design of our specific facilities. Just real quickly, you know, any, any company that comes before a community is going to want to talk about things that are important to community budgets uh, as well as area workforces. Our planned deployment in Montgomery County over the next couple of years will generate through a series of different uh, activities associated with it nearly an eight, $18 million investment in this community. Um, it is not a huge economic development program, but it is, it is real financial investment in Montgomery County through air, things like field surveys, permit applications, material and equipment logistics, the actual physical construction of these facilities, and making sure we are operating, opera, I can't say the word, that we are making the system work properly. <laughs> <laughs> I know the word in my head, but Optimize. it does come out the mouth. Optimize. Thank you all. Um, and of course, there are, you know, a, a, a relative handful of uh, associated workforce opportunities that come with that. Uh, it's not by any means blow your socks off, but there are some, some real workforce implications. So once again, we are thankful to be here tonight and have the opportunity to talk about mobility, uh, who we are, what we're looking to do, and more importantly, answer your questions about how we plan on engaging with Montgomery County and your local jurisdictions to ensure that our operations are providing you good service, that you are getting optimal data connect connectivity in your communities, and that we are not a burden to you, um, both in our, our deployment uh, and in our physical presence uh, for years to come. So thank you. We thank look you. forward to your questions. Thank you, Mr. Hartman. Um, I am now going to go around the room and take your questions, and I see lots of hands already going up. I just want to remind you that we are videotaping this, and as I come over, I'd like you to tell us who you are, introduce yourself, and tell us where you're from. And I'm going to start with this gentleman right here. 
I'm going to hold the mic. Oh, thank you. Hi, my name is Rick Popowitz. I'm a resident of Stonebridge for the last 29 years. I've lived in the county for 36 years. Um, the two presentations that we received from uh, the technology group, um, I appreciate that. Thank you very much. Uh, you've spent the last 25 minutes, so I would beg that I get at least five minutes. Uh, so the first point is that we can all agree that um, cellular data usage is increasing and mobile data usage is increasing. However, I think that you're using a false equivalency, that you are taking the overall data usage and you're saying that it is reflective of residential areas. I think that is very problematic. So when you talk about 48% of our nation having uh, mobile phones, absolutely. But we also have other things. And um, I think that there's an absolute false equivalency when you talk about the percentage of people who use phones or the percentage of video that's going to be delivered via cellular connections or mobile connections. So I just want to make that point that statistics, quite frankly, are great, but they can lie. And numbers can say anything that you want. And so therefore, by very definition, I have real questions. So basically, the points that I'd want to make, and then um, they're with predicates, are the following. And that is that what we have is we have a, prob we have a solution looking for a problem that effectively, I am a person very strongly opposed to the construction of these small cell phone towers, as you call them. We are living in residential communities. We are not living in highly dense communities. We are living in small, high, you know, very um, small, dense populated communities. So the basic issue um, really is, is uh, misstated. The second factor is that we already have high-speed internet connection. We have it from multiple um, sources. I personally just had 150 over 150 MIPS uh, conduct, um, brought to my house by uh, Verizon. So the reality is that many of us are not looking for high-speed internet connection in our homes because we already have it. Sir, do you have a question? We yes. want to get So the, the basic question, and, and I'm sorry, but they spent a fair amount of time, and I'm just going to quickly go through it. So the bottom line is, I, I think that you need to place the area, you need to place towers in areas where homes are not there, that they are an eyesore, that they lower property values, that lower property values mean less taxes for the county, less taxes for the county means less services for its residents. This is a bad, bad option. And quite frankly, when I hear $18 million invested, I say, what are you making? What is your ROI? At the end of the day, this is about money. This is about the needs of large corporations. You each talked about your companies being Fortune 5, um, I'm sorry, um, publicly traded companies. And quite frankly, it should not be about money. It should be about community needs. When we bought into our communities, we bought into residential communities. We did not buy into communities that would have eyesores. Um, did you want to respond, Ms. Herrera? Um, well, let me just uh, I, let me just say that one thing to recognize in the fed. So I appreciate your comments. One thing to recognize under the federal statute it, it is not driven by community need. And you so and uh, let me just say I I I'm only telling you. Okay, the council member. Let me let me let, let me let's try let's try to have a dialogue. Okay, so first, what we're talking about is a federal statute that's passed by the U.S. Congress, and in the back, in the back, we I printed the statute because what you'll see is that the statute's goal is to encourage competition and to support the needs of commercial providers to offer service. And what you're recognizing is that you receive, for example, broadband in a means where you have a wire that comes to your house, usually from a cable provider. And that works just fine. And another company comes along and says, I want to use a different technology in which I don't use, wi I don't use wires at all. 
And, and when, the, when the FCC talks about things like 5G and preempting local zoning and all those things, what they're looking to do is to say, well, here's a new company, and they want to use a different technology. And the way that the law is set up is that we are not permitted to say, well, there's already one technology that's there. That's just fine. So what our job is to do is to try to find a way to manage the requirements that we cannot prohibit companies with good zoning. So I recognize your point that you already have one means of getting it. What I'm just trying to say is that the federal law sets out that we cannot pick between different technologies, that we cannot prohibit these different technologies. And so we just have to find a way to be thoughtful and to address residents' concerns, to address issues of notice, and to balance that. Thank you. Thank you. We're, we're going to try to get to as many questions, sir. That is why does it have to be in a residential area when these same towers can be put in other areas that are non-residential, not with um, the proximity of children and others? So while I can appreciate your basic consideration of technology, it really becomes one place we can have that I have to ask that we all be t polite to each other, to the staff who's trying to answer everyone's questions, and to allow everyone to have their, their questions answered. So appreciate it if we let the mic be passed around by uh, Sonia. Okay. Yeah. So I'm going to answer to that right. question. So, so let, okay, so like all right, let's, let's provide one. First is, we have been talking about all of these different polls. They, are, they do different things. For the larger, taller, so let me start by saying, the, the fact that people are using a lot of video, watching cat videos on their phone, people, hold on. Why is it in neighborhood? Okay, so let me, let me get to that point. The fact is, is that newer, broadband spectrum that the FCC is making available has different physical characteristics. It doesn't travel as far. In order to use it, you have to have antennas roughly that are at 17 to 22 feet. It only travels about 250 feet, which is why you see these smaller cells where they want to place them roughly 500 to 1,000 feet apart. In some neighborhoods where you have above ground utility poles, uh, other structures where you can hang antennas, you don't have to add new infrastructure. But particularly in areas where most of the utilities are underground, you have to add something in order to get that kind of coverage. So the, as you push out new, smaller cell technology that requires antennas to be closer to the ground, those antennas need to be closer to residents, closer to wherever the devices are. For the taller towers, 120, 75, those do not necessarily need to be in residential neighborhoods, and the county has, through its zoning, encouraged that those types of towers go to industrial areas or on large major intersections where that type of taller structures is more likely to blend in with the various uh, a medical building that may be there, a convenience store, and so forth. Thank you. We want to get to as many questions as possible. Please tell me your name and where you're from. My name is Sue Present. I am a resident and longtime homeowner in Silver Spring. And I am here to ask the council representatives to please keep and protect the conditional use process. Um, if this county were faced with a known cyber threat that could paralyze its operations, then it would take immediately preventive measures. Yet the threats looming over OZA are just as real, regardless of any ZTA that were passed. Um, right now, a Crown Castle or a Mobility or a Verizon or a T-Mobile 
has the power to file a massive number of conditional use applications. And as a result, it can jam county operations and override the will of the people and the will of the council through the automatic shot clock provisions. So I'm asking for emergency zoning legislation. It's needed to limit the conditional use applications from a single applicant. I suggest a reasonable, reasonable limit might be somewhere in the range of three to five applications per month. Now, there have been suggestions of bundling a single carrier's DAS applications, but that would undermine the conditional use process because it would force uh, it would undermine the conditional use process uh, by forcing residents into a group and therefore requiring them by law to be represented by council. Now, it's possible to develop a ZTA that incorporates the type of limits that have been suggested and even the spaces between carriers, regardless of carrier, as was suggested by the planning board. <clears throat> and other important standards in, in the right of way for installations with, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> without eliminating the conditional use requirement in residential zones. The conditional use hearing is the only thorough and fair way for a review process that exists for residents in the residential areas and only through specific uh, constraints recorded in a conditional use order, would carriers be restricted in their modifications and co-locations, which can be much larger under the Spectrum Act rules. So what is the council's position on emergency zoning legislation such as this and on protecting the conditional use process? If I may, as a, as a zoning attorney for the county, um, Number one, under state law, there is no such thing as a zoning emergency. Um, there, there, there is uh, emergencies under, under bills, but not under zoning. It still takes the same uh, notice and time that, that any other zoning text amendment uh, would take. Uh, the, the second uh, thing is that uh, certainly uh, 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 revising the the conditional use process is something that the council can take up if they, if they consider this further. Uh, limiting the number of applications, I, I'd have to look at that. I don't have a good answer for that now. I, I, I would, don't. <laughs> well, I, I think that you would have difficulty. You, you could try to negotiate something with a provider, but the federal law is clear that the, the purpose, the, if you sort of look at, there's been shot clocks, there's limitations on local authority. So if you come in with something where it's somehow you're now saying is that I'm limiting your ability to deploy um, and you have to look at, am I having the effect of prohibiting provision of service? That might be difficult to sustain. Explain so the, sh the shot clock, so as, as there's two shot clocks that apply. The first shot clock is that when we have applications that come in, the county has an obligation to review those in a timely manner and to issue its findings, whether you're gonna approve it or not, in written form and with reasons why. The federal law says that if you're doing a co-location where you're installing on something that exists, you have 90 days to do it, and if it's for a new one, you have 150 days to do that. And the county, we streamlined our procedures to be compliant in that. The second shot clock that applies, uh, let me first finish up. At the end of that shot clock, if the county hasn't taken action, the provider has the ability to go to court to sue the county um, to, for approval or for action. For the second shot clock, this deals with what Congress called minor modifications. And I will tell you that this was part of the Budget Act and it was approved over the objections of the National Association of Counties, the National League of Cities, and the U.S. Conference of Mayors. And what it says is that local governments have to approve minor modifications, which the FCC decided would be things that add 
or up to 20 feet on a pole and that may extend out six feet. The county has an obligation to address those within and to, to review those and approve within 120 days or they will be deemed granted. Um, we want to get to as many questions as possible, so if you can please say your question from the top so we can get around the room. Um, for those questions we don't get um, answered, I just want to make sure everybody knows the council has launched a web page on this topic, and you can go to their website and they have a whole Q&A of questions and answers. But sir, first tell me your name. I'm going to hold the mic and yeah. tell me where you're from. Yeah, I'm from my name is Bob Sonawane. I live in North Potomac, uh, Maryland. I've been a citizen uh, of the, in living in this county for the last 30 years. And I have a question related to a health issue. I know the FCC has ruled out that the low radio frequency doesn't cause any kind of health effects. Myself worked for 30 years at EPA and did the risk assessment of chemicals and several agents. Even this low frequency is supposed to be low frequency, doesn't cause any kind of cancer. I will read, and you can read it yourself. You can go to Google. International Agency for Cancer Research has clearly said that the frequency, not necessarily uh, uh, the, uh, coming out of cell towers, but likely to cause DNA damage. It's likely to cause cancer, specifically brain cancer, and more specifically in children. The, I am concerned about the citizens of this county, the little kids that may be exposed to even low frequency or a short-term exposure versus a long-term exposure. I think the county has a responsibility to get the correct ruling on this, even the FCC is not a health agency. Keep that in mind. Read the, <laughs> the FCC is not a health agency. FCC has fought over the EPA. EPA has not ruled into this. I know it. I work for the EPA. Go to the, uh, uh, the uh, websites of the all different federal agencies. If there is the equivocal data. The data is not clear. However, there are some positive studies and negative studies. I would urge, for the sake of this county's safety and health safety, county has to be responsible for making sure there are no long-term effects of these frequencies on kids. Mm. Uh, Mr. Just, Zines. Just one point. The FCC is not a health agency, but it is a federal agency. Uh, and, and, <laughs> And, and the, the, problem, the problem for the county is that we are preempted. Uh, as much as we would like to or, or not uh, concern with that problem, uh, we just cannot. Uh, the answer lies in changing the law of Congress. Why are we having this meeting if you can't have rights? We, we can do lots of things within regulating it, but not on the basis of health. My, my name is David Fialkoff. I live in North Potomac. I, I just want to briefly first preface this by saying to our council members, to our county employees who are paid by us to represent us, you've got a lot of angry, concerned people here, and the attitude we see from you is, oh, well, it's just business as usual, and there's nothing we can do. Can you please exhibit some concern? Look at the concern here. Look at all the emails you've been getting. Look at the explosion of concern about this. We'd like to see it from you and not this laid back attitude. Now my question is, the way this was framed at the beginning of the session tonight was not what I believe to be accurate. Um, this started from a proposal for a zoning change by Crown Castle for its own benefit, for the benefit of its 200 applications, that it doesn't want to be considered individually, just wants to be able to put these things up willy-nilly. And um, I don't think this has anything to do with, uh, it, correct me if I'm wrong, is there some proposal to put uh, certain uh, limitations in place? It has to be this many feet from the front of a house, it has to be this, that, and the other thing, or is the only question whether or not you're going to change the zoning law to, to allow uh, people to put up these polls without any individual hearings? Mr. Zine? Uh, I mean, it's, um, uh, I, I hear the anger, I, I understand it, I, I try to, to, uh, to get through 
uh, I, I try to, to, okay. Okay. done deal there, this is public process I put something out there for comment we're commenting we've gotten some actually helpful com uh, suggestions tonight already with respect to the conditional use process the question is should we have any rules at all that contain where these can be located that's really the question that's really well, we, well, we could do nothing, as I said. I said that before. We could do nothing. And maybe we won't do anything. Well, right, and we don't have to do that. That, that is correct, sir. You're absolutely correct. These are all really very... Well, but we won't achieve any protection for you. And that is the concern. Well, uh, well, well, and and that that is why we came up with some some terms, some restrictions and some limits. Now maybe that's not enough, and that's okay. Maybe we won't do anything. The question is, do we have any put anything in place? Uh, maybe we can t continue it as a conditional use. Fine. Will it solve your concerns? I'm not entirely sure. It would give more opportunity for public engagement. Can we manage all these applications? That's the challenge for the county. Maybe we can, maybe we can't. But those are all valid concerns and no one is being ignored here. That's why, this is why we're having this conversation. This has been pending for months and we haven't taken any action. We're listening, we're trying to figure it out. That's all this is. I know people feel to the contrary. And I can't fix that except to tell you genuinely and with concern we're just trying to figure out a way to protect our community. End of story. Uh, let's Sonia. Okay, we might. Do, well, we can't just say no. And you heard from the staff. That that's the challenge. George. Sure. Here's my colleague. Okay. If let let me just repeat what I said at the beginning of the meeting. The council members would like to protect the community as much as we can, but federal law does preempt county law. That, well, you can say it's not true. Friends, if you're just gonna scream at us, federal law, sir, so, okay, sir, here's, as the council president said, we're gonna try to have one speaker at a time, we're gonna try to be polite. I have the floor for just a moment. Federal law, the Congress is more powerful. The laws that Congress passes preempt what local government can do, that's the way a federal system works. Actually, his staff is here. Congressman Delaney has staff here. Very good. Okay, friends. The council president set this up so that you could all get questions answered and that council members can learn, too, the maximum amount of protection that we can provide for you. That's what we want to do. Mr. Reamer. Yeah, I just add to that. So my analysis of the situation is that federal law is biased against the concerns of the community and what we can do is try to negotiate the best outcome that we can in light of that circumstance. If we do nothing, they will proceed through the process that exists and they will get their installations because that's what the FCC has entitled them to. So we have the opportunity now to negotiate a solution that provides some protections. Your question is correct. Where, where are the protections? We do need protections in here and I think there is a tender balance where we could get a better system than what they want. Let's also be clear with respect to Mr. Delaney. Mr. Delaney is a member of the minority party in Congress. Let's be clear who controls the Congress and how laws, how laws get passed. I, okay, sir. Okay, Sonia, maybe the gentleman would like to have the microphone. Mr. Katz. I, I did want to point out that, and I'm not going to repeat everything that's been said, and I know everybody else wants to speak, but bottom line is what we've seen are the pictures up there with, from the commercial areas. 
And they're not nearly the, con as far as I can tell from, from people that I've chatted with, that's not nearly the concern of the residential areas. Not to say that there is not health concerns or whatever, regardless of where they are, but is a whole nother story. But I think we need to focus on the residential areas, why you need it there, and why it has to be 30 foot. I, I, you know, you've shown in your drawings that there's been changes in technology over the few years that, that this has been in existence. I'm probably the least handy person you're ever going to meet in your life, but I can tell you that I don't know that there's not better technology that could create what, what, we, what the FCC is requiring of us and not have the same visual impact or other impacts in our residential neighbor, neighborhoods. And that's what I think we need to focus on. We we have and another I know to stop when I get applause, so here you go. Thank we have you. another question over here. First, sir, tell me your name and where you're from. My name is Richard Jurgeny. I'm from Darnstown, Maryland. And what's your question? My question is, uh, one, I want to know why specifically we cannot deny these applications. In 2012, Congress passed the Middle Tax Class Tax Relief and Job Creation Act. In that sixty four oh nine <laughs> essentially says that a city cannot deny permission to modify an existing wireless tower or a base station, provided that the modifications don't exceed certain size limits. Section 6409 and the subsequent FCC rulemaking that clarified some terms make it unamb unambiguously clear that it only applies to existing sites. New sites. Existing sites. We can deny the. Anyone? No. Okay. Let me just try to respond to that. Um, so what you mentioned is when I told you that there were two shot clocks, the statute that you looked at is the second shot clocks, which is modifications of existing facilities. And the relief for that is if you don't act, they're deemed granted. In a separate proceeding, the FCC has determined that we have to act on other applications in 90 to 150 days. Under federal law, there are limits to what we can do. But what folks mentioned here tonight, I think is what we are trying to get at, particularly in residential neighborhoods, the county does have zoning authority. It's very difficult to come and simply say no, but it is very, very possible to use that process so that you can limit, for example, in the ZTA that was proposed, that anything new would be placed between properties, not right in front of your front door. That you can use the processes that encourage streamlining so that uh, if they are painted a certain color, if they are within a certain height, that those types of things are within the county's power to manage those. That we can use the process to ensure that there is notice provided. Those are the types of things that we can do that the county is focused on doing and part of the goal of the process and sometimes, I apologize, it, it, it can seem messy because the only way to get these things going sometimes is you have to introduce some kind of bill to start that conversation. And if it, if it sort of came across in a way that seemed like it was a done deal, it is not. Because all of these people are here and have been working on this because they are interested in crafting a bill that helps to do the things that we can that manages what we have in those neighborhoods. And so those specific types of things, uh, that's what we're looking for. Don't like what you hear tonight? Go get 
sir, sir, tell me your name and where you're from. I'm gonna hold the mic. Okay. Uh, uh, my name is Gary Featheringham. I'm a resident of North Potomac and in the Stone Bridge View area. I particularly do not care to see these ugly towers in my front yard because there's nothing there except street lights currently. I have one question, and I'll ask it, but I want to make a comment to the audience first. If you don't like the answer, we have a solution for you. The question is, I feel like we're getting spoon-fed a solution. Our question to you is, what are you doing to do go against and fight the FCC? They're doing this. All right, my, my option, my, uh, my comment to the whole audience is what uh, Dick Jurgen had just stated. If you don't like these answers, you, in two weeks, have a permission to go and vote on question B and say term limits to our county councils, for they are not representing us in the elections. And it The council and, and the county did join in a lawsuit to oppose uh, the, the FCC rulemaking, and we lost that suit in the Fourth Circuit. But we did try to uh, oppose it in court. Andy Spivak, I'm a citizen of North Potomac, uh, Montgomery County resident for <laughs> Montgomery County resident for nearly 43 years, which is all of them. Um, <laughs> at the beginning of this session, uh, Councilmember Leventhal referred to the ZTA as attempting to establish or maintain protections for county citizens. Uh, the council has also indicated that its ability to protect us is somewhat limited by existing Maryland state law. My question to the council is, if the state is willing to afford the council the ability to impose additional controls and protections, would you use that capability to offer us the additional protections we seek? We will do everything that we can do legally to protect you. That's what we're trying to do. We're trying to understand the parameters of how far we can go to prevent undesirable impacts in your neighborhood. That's why we're all here. That's what your council members want to do. I just want to go back also to the earlier question. We did sue. We joined the lawsuit. I actually asked my colleagues to support funding for our law firm, BB&K, one of the nation's top telecom law, law firms in the public interest, to sue. We, so, we sued. We lost. Absolutely. We're going to keep fighting. But I just want you to know, it's not like we haven't been trying. We have been trying. Tell me your name and where you're from. Deborah Hein, I am actually in the northern part. I'm up in the Germantown area. I actually have a couple of questions. You know, when we want to do something, it seems like the EPA can come in and stop us from having anything done because of health issues. This gentleman over here who worked for the EPA is saying there is a possible health risk. Why can't our county council go back to Mr. Delaney? Oh, we don't we have an election coming up? I think I see his name a lot, Delaney. Why aren't we going back to our council, you know, our congressmen and our senators and saying, look, if the APA is saying that there's a problem here, they stop everything else, why aren't our county councilors going to the EPA and saying, hold up, why can't we do a health assessment here and find out what the real health risks are to our children? I see another question over here. Tell me your name and where you're from. Yes, hi. Okay, so, so, okay. Okay, okay. Well, I, I, I'm one of the council members, so, and my colleagues are, look, we, w we wish we could change the federal no. law. I'm not. I'm not sure. Uh, this is a good. This is a. This is a good thing to bring up with the members of Congress. Absolutely. Well, and it's. Well. Okay. We. Our 
that I also sit on the FCC's Consumer Advisory Committee. We have raised, we have raised with the FCC that the, that the number one, the two, the two largest concerns that we get from constituents is what does it look like and what's the health effect? And we have told the FCC, you have jurisdiction you need to actually exercise your authority to address the concerns that residents have. I can tell you that Montgomery Public Schools did a study in 2015. They looked at the, the because, because they were looking at the Wi-Fi devices in the classroom, the Chromebooks and various things, and they found, their outside consultant found that they were all within the parameters that the FCC issues. So let me say, that we have on numerous times gone in to lobby various members of Congress. We have lobbied the FCC and we will continue and I will tell you as well that we invited every office from the FCC and two different bureaus to attend this meeting and not one of them came and what I told the chairman in the, in the last meeting that we had is that they need to actually be taking the lead on this and addressing the concerns, particularly as we move out to 5G and we have a need to deploy more of these things. But it is, the reason why Congress did that is because they wanted to have a national policy, and, and I agree with you, that we do need to get more of these federal agencies to address the concerns that residents have. The chairman has said that he wants to, that there needs to be an education campaign, and this is part of it. And it doesn't help that we are taping this, we will provide this record to them. But yes, it is true that we do need to have better cooperation from federal agencies to use the authority that they have to address those issues. How much has the, how much lobbying? There, I'm sorry, sir, but you've, you've actually had a couple questions and there's someone. <laughs> Hi, I'm, I'm Donna Barron. I live in North Potomac in the Wesley, Wesley uh, subdivision. First of all, let me tell you, no offense, but your equipment is really ugly. And our neighborhoods do not have telephone poles like what you're showing. We have all underground wires and nice little light poles. That's it. So what I also wonder is there's the federal government, there's the FCC, there's the Montgomery County government, and then somehow there's all these little marks right in North Potomac where there aren't any telephone poles. So how did all of this come down to plop right on top of Montgomery on uh, North Potomac where we don't have all those big buildings and telephone poles and six lane highways where you've already installed your poles. Mr. Donahue. Earlier, Rich Rothrock was describing the, uh, some numbers and the question about statistics and the point well taken, but nationwide, upwards of 50%, 48% in the last count, of folks don't have a landline, use wireless phones exclusively. The challenge is in trying to get those folks coverage in the neighborhoods, that's the very challenging, and then in particular, where the, where the utilities are on the ground. As the woman says, where you don't have, where you don't have telephone poles, distribution poles, where you don't have power lines above ground, where we don't have a water tank where we can install antenna, it's very challenging, which is the reason we've got to be, we've got to be close enough to the residential customers in order to meet the demand coming from the residences. Okay. Wi-Fi's got another other challenges, question. sir. We have another question back here. Tell me your name and where you're from. My name is Lisa Klein. I live in Gaithersburg. Um, I... First of all, Pokemon Go is not a demand, okay? That is, um, and watching, 
watching kitty videos is not a demand. So just in, to respect the audience, I'd strip that out of your spiel because it's insulting, quite honestly. Um, but I think it's important to recognize that the county is getting pressure from the FCC, and I do appreciate that. Um, I think you're in a unique position with all of these applications coming in to push back on the FCC. They have their, their data and, and testing and research is now over 20 years old. The, the tests were done on a 220-pound Marine, um, not a child. Um, it only tested for thermal damage, which is burning of the skin. So since then, and I will, I will direct you to the NIH study, I mean, EPA, fantastic. I know they're on board with this um, curiosity about more science as well. But there is an NIH study that came out of the National Toxicology um, Division that actually decided to accelerate the test because rats were showing up with cancer. So I think you are in a unique position to leverage these 200 applications that are coming in to say, if we're going to set a precedent by having all the applications come in, let's set a precedent for precautionary um, safety measures to protect the people. Hi, I'm Janice Sartucci with the Parents Coalition of Montgomery County, and we've actually been tracking the cell towers on public school land for some time. Um, I might be the only person or one or two people that have ever been to a tower committee meeting. So let's take this back to what we can actually control. And we can control the tower committee. And with all due respect to, to Ms. Williams, um, she's lovely and wonderful, but the tower committee is doing nothing but rubber stamping these applications. And I can tell you that because I've been to the tower committee meetings. I've seen the process. Sometimes there isn't even an address. There's just longitude and latitude information. There isn't any detail. On the last agenda just recently, we, we caught applications for towers that shouldn't, weren't even in Montgomery County. They were in other, other jurisdictions. Do you have a question? My question is, what is the council going to do to enforce the law that exists with regard to the powers of the tower committee? They are actually tasked with, I will read to you, um, what is it? Oh, here, it's right here. Um, with minimizing adverse impacts upon citizens. So first of all, we need the tower committee meetings to be open and easily attended. Right now, they're, they're conference calls. The people call in and punch buttons and say yes to applications and at, that they've never seen or that they're not actively reviewing. They take the tower committee consultants' information verbatim. There's no review. We've seen them pass on applications where the owner of the property has not consented to even build the tower. And the tower committee gives it a rubber stamp yes. So the council can control the tower committee. They can put, can put the law in place and start clamping down on the existing legal review. And I want to know what the council is going to do about that. Okay, so, so first off, the, the tower committee meetings are public meetings. You, the, Margie runs them and they are, they are run in person. Some of the members do participate by telephone calls, but they are available. The agenda is posted in advance. The, 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 I will say that we have as a result of, and let me just go back again. We've gotten in the last four months more applications for new and replacement poles than we had in the last 18 years. So it has, it has caused us in some places to look at things that we had sort of been percolating in the background and it's kind of brought them up to the fore. So one of the things that we're actually looking at are those regulations themselves how to manage those applications coming in. But let me be clear that the tower committee exists primarily to determine, is there another location that you could use for co-location so you wouldn't have to build a new tower? Will what you're adding create any interference for an existing use? And for all the applicable zoning laws, are you complying with it? 
That is what the purpose of it is. And what ends up happening is if somebody wants to do a purpose that, it, that they, need a, they need a conditional use, the county uses the engineering review that the tower committee has done as part of that hearing. So what we're trying to do is also to be efficient so that you have an initial review that is looking at engineering. But the issues of any special exceptions to zoning, those are handled by the Office of Zoning and Hearing. Can I that too? I'm Lee Affelbach. I'm the engineer that works on this project with our oh, this team from Columbia Telecommunications. Uh, we do go out and we have looked at every one of these sites. I think we've gone through all the Crown Castle sites now. We're going out of there to check the coordinates, check the addresses on them, some of the information, a lot of applications. So you can imagine there's a lot of typo errors, and it's a lot of work working those out in the field. I can personally tell you because I was out walking them one day. Um, we also, as a part of that, actually checked the area for cell service. We've gone back uh, to, the, to the service provider, in this case Verizon, to look at the coverage in that area. We've also looked at the applications relative to the current FC standard, FCC standards for air for radiation. Now, I am an engineer. I'm not a, a medical professional in any way. Uh, but I do look at those applications. I look at them in the context of what is the FCC regulation and how does this, how does this application fit relative to the FCC regulation. And what I found in all cases, we're talking about numbers of 5% of the FCC maximum or less. They're relatively low. Again, we're going through the, excuse me. What does that mean? I'm sorry. Uh, there, there is a, FCC has a chart that basically lays out the, the RF, the energy level that can be provided near a transmitter site and how close you can get to that site. That would require a waiver that there's actually a hazard. Excuse me? Uh, are you giving this presentation or can I finish what I have to say? I am respectful. I am trying to just finish. The question is, the question was, look, ask your question again. Okay, so I think the answer to that that Jeff mentioned is within five feet, a label is required. We have another question here. Tell me your name. And yeah, hi. My name is Drew Morris. I live in the Stonebridge community. My question is, uh, given that there are health concerns, if there is a change in the law in the future, is there any provision that the county has at the moment that means that these poles either come down or are modified to address the new laws? There. Uh, with, with, within the, uh, uh, all of the Sorry, friends. just amend one last thing. I mean, I, just, I, I, I wanted to just specifically say, um, you know, they, there's all these issues with non-conforming use. So something that would, uh, let's say, predate a law could, you know, would not be covered under it. I want to make sure that if we're erecting something today and the laws change, we discovered that there is actually a health concern, the FCC gets overruled in court, whatever happens, do these polls come down? There is, a, there is a provision in the, in the franchise agreement for unused equipment to come down. Uh, and and the, the, real, the real, I think, the gravamen of your question is if FCC changes their rules such that these things cannot operate, uh, would we stop them and have they come down? If we find out that they're dangerous, I mean, if, if we find out that these things are actually dangerous and the FCC uh, it's overruled in court or, or whatever it is. I, I don't want to be put in a position, I don't think anybody here wants to be put in a position where we find out, okay, there is a danger, but now these poles are already up and they can't be taken down because they, you know, they, they right. went up before the law. All right, so I'm going to say that I think that that's a thoughtful suggestion and that to, to try to find a way to legally craft something that's reserving your right. If the law changes and you have more rights or the law changes and says that you um, it's not it's not a permissible use that yes We should look for some language yeah. that we can put in there that reserves our right to do it. That's a very helpful suggestion Thank you. We have another question back here uh, My name is Peter Chung, and I live in the Wesley neighborhood, and I'm here. Uh, I can hold this. No, I'm oh, okay hold it. <laughs> So I'm here to oppose the uh, cell tower installations, especially at the uh, 148282 Fief Drive location um, um, So looking at the, the 
question and answers that Montgomery County has provided regarding why the county can't prohibit cell antennas in residential areas. It says here that because of the 1996 federal FCC law, cell phone companies have the right to close a significant gap in their cell coverage. So if it is determined that a significant gap exists, the law allows cities and counties to require that these companies fill this gap. But so far, it seems like there's been no evidence that there is this significant gap. In my neighborhood, in, in my neighborhood, I did a Verizon check, and it's all red. We have connection. We have data. There, where is this significant gap coming from that you're trying to fulfill? Right? So, 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 okay, so, so I'm trying to Also, all, I'm not done yet. Now, also, <laughs> Uh, based on the same Q&A, it says here that these propositions or, or the requirements are, are, well, let me read it from my, my own notes. As stated in the Montgomery County fact sheet on cell antennas, the push to install a tower at that location is based solely on the opinion of the applicant, Crown Castle, that current network capacity is not sufficient. You guys wrote that, right? So have you, Montgomery County, have you guys done your, have you guys done your due diligence to check against to see there is this significant gap that you need to fill? Because in my neighborhood, we all have good cell phone coverage data plan. Uh, uh, again, Verizon, the company that you guys are trying to build these towers for, it says we have good coverage. So why do we need these additional cell towers in this place, right? Now, that's one question. Another question is, um, we keep on hearing, oh, it's federal law, it's FCC, we can't do anything about it. And this is addressed to Montgomery County Council. But there's been, I've just been studying in the last half a day because I became aware of it, and, and I became more aware of it because it's my neighbor that's getting this tower, and I have three young kids, I'm unconcerned. But there's precedents in California and Long Island. They've refused or denied these, the same FCC requirement to install these uh, cell towers. So you guys make it sound like, oh, we're, we have our hands tied and we can't do anything. When there's been precedents, and there's been, what, in California, the Ninth Circuit Court has overruled based on the, the determination of this significant gap uh, of coverage. Um, another thing I read in New York Times article, it says here that, uh, it says that health concerns are not a valid reason for, for the mun municipality to deny zoning for cell tower or antenna. However, property values and aesthetics do qualify according to the act. So do your, search it up. I, I don't know the writer, I don't know the writer of that New York Times uh, the author, you can call them or contact them. It's fairly recent. It's like three or four years old. So they know something that you guys don't. So reach out. Do something for us. You're our government. You, you, satisfy, you, you support. You are serving us, especially for our well-being. And lastly, uh, just on that, the, the, the World Health Organization has categorized these RF signals as level two or class B carcinogenic, and it's in the same category as lead, DDT, and uh, what's the, and um, e engine exhaust. So think about that. For our family, our children, I know right now, right now, it says, hey, health concerns are not a big deal per the law, but you have these other two areas where you can try to refute it or, or fight back. All right. Thank you. Yeah. the coverage? Yeah, sure. Um, absolutely valid question. Um, I am going to have our senior RF engineer from Verizon, Jose Espino, answer the question for you. So the question is why? What's the need? Is that it's basically? It's already got capacity. Do we already have capacity? So you have service right now because we planned ahead. Um, your neighborhood is being served by surrounding macro sites. Uh, specifically, you are being served on 700 megahertz, which is the lowest frequency which we're uh, licensed to transmit on. That is not where we have the majority of our bandwidth, which is, you can think of that as a, as a freeway. That's not, not the largest freeway. We have that capacity and higher frequencies. 
you're being served right now because we anticipated the usage and we anticipated the need years ago. We're looking years ahead at what is coming. We analyze data traffic every day. We look at where it's coming from. We look at how it's trending. And we make a design to accommodate that. It takes a long time to build infrastructure. So we have to start ahead of time. You're experiencing good service right now because we thought ahead. That's why. We want you to continue to experience good service. As demand increases, your coverage will decrease because this, the, the mobiles closer to the genesis of the signal, to the, the cell site that's actually providing service, are going to demand more service. And the further away that, that is currently being provided, the, 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 the UEs, the, um, the, the devices, the mobile phones that are further away are going to have less and less and less power from the this, from this cell site. It's the nature of the, of the technology. Every day, yeah. <laughs> would have sent us something and said, hey, you're going to run out of, of coverage soon, so we're going to propose to do these towers. If you had done that, you wouldn't have all these angry people. Instead, you went to Crown Castle, and Crown Castle went and asked for a zoning change and tried to cram this down our throats. If you had done it the right way, you would have had a better chance of getting it done. Okay, we have another question here. What is, what is your name? I'm going to hold mine. My name is Aaron Rosenswag. I live in Gaithersburg with chickens. 7800 Brickyard Road. No citizen should have a 68 foot cell tower within 30, 40 feet of their home. We're running out of time. Do you have a question? Yes, I have a question. If you go to 7800 Brickyard Road, you will see such a thing. A mistake was made in approving the cell tower in front of this house because originally it was a 20 foot pole. And not all of these things that we heard. They, we hear that people get on their feet and they go and they look at the place. We hear that the, everybody looks at it, but what they heard was that this was a modification, the minor modification. We heard that, those words earlier today, that that must be approved. This was a 20-foot pole that was replaced with a 68-foot pole. One week before Christmas. No notification because they thought that the federal rules could allow them to do that without notifying anyone. So right now, today, this pole still stands there. And I ask you to concur with what I just said. And we're talking about these 30-foot poles and everything. And we've heard other people say, what happens if things change? It was wrong then. It's wrong now. That 68-foot pole still stands. We made a mistake as a county. We failed. It fell through the cracks. Can we fix it? Let me see a raise of hands. If this happened to you, would you want the taxpayer dollars to move this pole? <laughs> so I have here a petition with another location on county land, not very far away, that would make this work, make people happy. Do we have a champion that will look at this and see if we can move this poll using taxpayer dollars? We made a mistake, let's fix it. This is one thing we can fix, we can fix this one. Do I have a champion that will look at this? The RF studies, the NIH, and things like that. 
they they are not on our website no, at the county. Sir, so people can hear you, and it's being taped. Yeah. You should be in his office every day until this is resolved. He's, okay. Now I'm going to go back to this guy. I know. I, I thought it's right here. Yeah, hi. I'm Jim Sledge. I'm from Germantown. So there were, in the presentations, that it raised multiple questions. Um, they talked about relieving congestion. Why doesn't our own Wi-Fi do that? Who asked Crown Castle to um, resolve this congestion? Um, uh, how many 911 calls have failed as a result of poor or insufficient coverage? You told us how many there are, but no one knows how many are being failed. So maybe they're not failing. Um, but that seemed to be one of your big points on all of these. Uh, how have you, how have you, the county council, notified people? Because we're here because we know we're impacted today. There are 700 more polls that you know about short term that those people have no clue. So this is just the tip of the iceberg. I, you need to understand that. I don't know how you're notifying people, but I found out one was going next to my driveway because a reporter from Poolsville put a note on my door when I was on vacation. Not the best way to notify people. My next question is, there was nothing that addressed, does the county have a plan? There seems to be no planning. Proper planning prevents piss poor performance. So that seems to be where we are right now. The other thing that was not addressed in any of the uh, presentations were alternatives. But I do have a question. My grandson attends water, kindergarten at Waters Landing Elementary School. They're teaching respect, responsibility, and safety. They're pushing this into these kids. I sent to the county council members that are on the zoning uh, medical, peer-reviewed medical studies that are showing mounting evidence of related health issues, including significantly higher risk of type 2 diabetes, sleep disturbances, headache, dizziness, irritability, seems to be going around, uh, <laughs> concentration difficulties, and hypertension. So we're here because we have many concerns, including our health, the essence of our neighborhoods, where we chose to live, where utilities are underground. If you go forward with these installations, you threaten the beauty of our neighborhood, our property values, and our health. If you go forward with these installations, my grandson will have an antenna 35 feet away from his bedroom. And most people don't know this, there's at least three schools in Germantown where they're planning to be put up. So he has absolutely no way to escape these things in his life. My question to you, the council members, is how do you plan to demonstrate to my grandson and the rest of the citizens of Montgomery County that you are concerned about the three things that he's being taught? Our safety. You're being responsible in fulfilling your duties as our elected representatives, and you have respect for the oath each of you took when you were sworn into office. Thank you. Hey.
Thank you, sir. And as I, I've said uh, a number of times, this is actually what we are trying to do. Uh, right now, we're trying to put into, think about, figure out, with your help, and we've had some helpful suggestions here tonight, uh, of criteria that we can put into place with respect to these. You've heard, we're all frustrated with the FCC. And sure, we're gonna try to pressure them, and they've be, all been unsuccessful so far. But, so we're kind of stuck with this, these parameters. And the question is, is there a better way? Maybe not. This is helpful. We're trying to figure it out. And that's what the point of a community conversation is. And that's what we're doing here, here tonight, sir. Uh, we're trying to be respectful. We're taking our time. But we do have federal rules that, you know, at a certain point, you're going to get everything uh, that you may not want because we have been unable to craft a better path. And that is the challenge that we're, we're really trying to work through as we speak. All right, we have another question. Hi, yes, my name is Sonia Beekman. I live in North Potomac. Um, I was listening to all the presentations and three questions came to mind. Um, Mr. Hartman mentioned from mobility a very simple example of a flashlight that dispersed a beam. The first thing that came to my mind when you said these are smaller towers that have a more concentrated beam, when I was a kid, that's how we started a fire, by concentrating the energy. And so I would like an, uh, just a very simple explanation why concentrating all this energy is not going to further increase the health risk. That we're all kind of talking that there already are radio waves. The question is, what is the level that is dangerous or not, which itself is a question. So I think talking about concentration kind of scares me a little bit. Um, but the other thing that I, I wanted to ask is, it seems like everyone has said that it's a given that we have to have this in the neighborhood and we should come up with some regulations, some zoning, some suggestions. But I'm proposing, why do we have to accept it and find the areas within our community? Why can't we propose alternative non-residential locations that may serve the same purpose? If there's an issue, then we don't have to accept which house gets it, maybe we have to find a way to solve the problem in a way that doesn't impact residential communities. And the third thing is, I wanna know whether all of us here are guinea pigs. It seems like this is new technology. I wanna know, have there been other areas where you know towers have been put every 500, 1,000 feet or whatever, and have there been longitudinal epidemiological studies in those areas. Not they put it up yesterday and everyone is healthy today, but what's happened in 5, 10, 15, 20 years after poles have been put every 500 feet in a residential community? Do you have answers to any of those questions? Well, I'd like to speak to what you said because I, I agree and one of the things I think that I would like to see done and many other council members would like to see done is for the county to get an engineer on our side, on your side, to say, what's the best that we could do? Are there ways that we could place poles that would minimize the impact? We don't have to accept their proposal. That's what I'm, well, that's what I'm, okay, first of all, these are being installed elsewhere in the county in communities that don't have the underground, you know, that, but what, what I am suggesting, this is a conversation I had with Drew and, and Andy and Andrew, was can we look at, you know, streets, arterials that are nearby and figure out that they can get sufficient coverage by installing on those arterials that would allow, you know, you to have service in the neighborhood without bringing the installations into the neighborhood. I don't know if that's possible, but I think it's... Okay, she does have the floor, sir. She does have the floor. Okay. ...that are making this proposal. Can you show us other communities that have this same structure that you're proposing in the residential communities here and the long-term health studies that I'm asking for? Or are you asking us to be guinea pigs? I didn't get that answer. 
So to answer the first question, are you guinea pigs? Uh, no, you're, you're not guinea pigs. As I mentioned earlier, Crown Castle has been constructing small cell and DAS facilities across the country for the last 15 years. So it is... I think... So as far as studies go, Crown Castle is not the provider of the wireless service. We are an infrastructure provider. We are a transport company. We are, are, are building the infrastructure that the wireless carriers use to distribute their signal from point A to point B. So we are the infrastructure provider. And as such, we have been deploying these uh, types of facilities across the country for the last 15 years. With regards to uh, exposure studies, any kind of health risk studies, I would defer you to the, the various websites that are out there, the FCC, um, the um, EPA and such to, to understand the concerns that are related to the health effects. Another question back here, and I have to remind you all, we have to wrap up by 9 o'clock, so we want to get as many more questions as we can by 9. Your name and where you're from? Uh, my name is Margaret Johnson. I'm almost 14-year resident of Germantown, Maryland, and 16-year resident of the county. And my question is for Crown and Mobileity. You have the community here telling you we don't want your product. We don't want these poles. So are you still going to force them on us? Are you still going to build them? When we said no, we don't want it. Are you, uh, so, let's see if he answers. The, the applications the Crown filed two years ago uh, it was determined by the Tower Committee that those would be subject to the initial use permit and wouldn't begin going through Tower Committee only. Those applications have been withdrawn. So there was a suggestion earlier that the shot clock is running and, and these applications are going to be deemed approved and, and then sites are going to get built. It's not, in fact, the case. Crown has been working collaboratively with, the, with staff, with the Tower Committee, uh, with Jeff Zients and others, to try to come up with a, a text amendment. But it's the county's text amendment, and we're merely supporting it. All right, we have another question. Your name and where you're from? I'm Naomi Yacht. I'm with the North Potomac Citizens Association. We've been working with several people around uh, the county on this. One question we have, as you said, the shot clock isn't running. And it seems like there's a lot of interest of learning more, getting some ideas of how other um, cities have handled this. We mentioned uh, states that have fought it or cities that have fought it and won. Would you be willing to grant us a stay and not start the shot clock? so that we can learn more. The applications are not, they're not pending right now. The, the clock's not running on the shot clock. We, we have voluntarily told the shot clock at this time. So the applications have been pending for a considerable amount of time. The uh, agreement to toll the shot clock was until November. But we certainly can talk about where we can increase that. All right, we have another question here. Okay. Did you want to answer that? I thought I heard you indicate well, you wanted. Did you? The question was. Can we extend the shot yes. clock? Yes, we we are agreeable to extending that shot clock. Um, tolling agreement to a point where we feel comfortable moving forward as a, as a community and as an industry. I, I just want to, uh, I want to address, I want to address several people have, have talked about the, the alternatives. And I want to say that that's actually what we are trying to do. Montgomery County, when Marilyn Praisner was here in 1996, 1997, we enacted our first <coughs> tower ordinance. The purpose of that is that we wanted to manage and incentivize deployment so that it would go in industrial areas, places where you have commercial development. And that's what we created, what is now called the limited use process, is that if you met certain conditions, you go to the tower committee, and <coughs> by and large, you're done. And we reserve the conditional use the issue that we have right now is, and just with all due respect, most of this, it's not about telephones. It's not about voice. It is about the new spectrum and broadband. 
And part of it is, is that you have providers that want to compete and they want to offer, if some of you saw today, AT&T and DirecTV is going to offer a product where you could get 100 channels over the internet. And then AT&T is likely going to come in and say that you could get all of that using your wireless plan for us. It's those types of things. The way that this new spectrum is working is in order to get more speed, by having the pole and the device closer, they can reuse spectrum. They can make things faster. So what our challenge is now is similar to the way that in the 90s, when we had an explosion of this, and we managed it by trying to move it to commercial areas, now we have some places in some residential neighborhoods where there is nothing right now that you can co-locate on. So you have to have something new. We're trying to look at, do you keep the 30-foot setback? Do you say that you cannot install, which it says right now, you cannot install these on houses. You would not have poles if you had them on houses, but there's a lot of reasons why people would say, I don't want to have them on houses. So what we're trying to do right now, and I apologize if when we set up and talked about the FCC, we just wanted to set the table for these are the parameters that we have to work in. But that's what we want to do is to find out in those residential neighborhoods, is there a way that you can help incentivize that they go on major streets? Is there a way that you can limit how many you have to have? Is there a way that you can, within what the law permits us to do, have concerns, whether there's the color, the size, those other things, that have them fit in with the residential character of our neighborhoods? And that is really what we're facing now, is that in the same way in the 90s we managed it, now we have a new types and new classes of those, and that's what we're trying to work to do. All right. We have another question. Your name and where you're from? I'm Vasilios McGinnis from the North Potomac area. Let's be a little bit positive. Let's thank the county and the council members for what they're doing and enforce them to do more for us. I think that's the way to go. Be positive, but you have to do more. You have done some things and you have to do more. And you just mentioned some of those. But still the question remains, why this thing has to be outside of my bedroom window? That's the basic question. And you hear health studies, you hear depreciation of the houses, you hear, Nobody wants it. So let's try together to find a way to collocate those things in green areas, in buffer areas, in areas that we can. Why has to be at 500 feet and not use bigger antenna to be at 1,000 feet away or 2,000 feet away? These are the things that you can do for us. Montgomery County lost a battle, the legal battle, but did not lose the war. So, rebuttal and try again. FCC is up there. FCC is up there. And all cities, counties, states have to go and fight this thing. Join others. You're going to find plenty of people like this elsewhere. Join the battle. Rebuttal and let's go to the real war. Think the fish smells from the head, they say. And the head is up there and smells and stinks no matter how you're going to look at it. So let's try to do it that way. Thank you. All right. Well, tell me your name and where you're from. Yeah, Joseph Chu. I'm a resident of Montgomery County since 2000. Just a point that uh, Ms. Herrera brought up. You know, my neighborhood, before Fios came in, bef when we were still using dial-ups, it was a popular and highly demand neighborhood not because we had high speed, it was because the ambience and the everything that around the neighborhood. So using this thing as, you know, you'll be benefit to us, I think it's a fallacy. Second uh, point is to actually to Grand Castle. In your presentation, you talk about being good partners. You know, I have a hard time understanding what that means. You have, as already brought up, you have not reached out to the community. Your plan is tr not transparent to any of us. You want what you want, and you have not allowed us to put by some input on how that should be. Are you willing to compromise so that you can get something and we can get something? So that, you know, we're not requiring Wi-Fi or internet service or whatever service, 5G service, every single corner of our street. We're not requiring that. 
to answer your question, yes, we, the reason we're here tonight is to hear your concerns and to, to do our best to address those. Uh, as far as need is concerned, it's our tenants that are dictating where the need uh, needs to be addressed, and they have selected the, the communities that we're, we're actively looking at as the locations where they need to address their needs. We're running out of time. We've got one more question, and we're going to have to wrap it up. Um, tell me your name and where you're from. Eileen Highland. I'm a resident of Stonebridge. Um, my question is uh, about this legal issue and the, the fact that our hands are tied by the FCC. These laws were passed in 1996, 2012, and 2013. Um, our, uh, my neighbor, our neighbor here, referenced this study that was just completed by the government with a $25 million um, fund, uh, you, you know, uh, by the government. <laughs> uh, and this was just completed in May. And it says that, um, that with the increased, uh, if you're increasing the intensity of radiation, so does the increase of cancer, um, you know. So I'm wondering whether or not this new study could give uh, the, the, the county some grounds to object to the FCC. Um, I also would like to point out that in that law, um, it's U.S. Code Title 47, Chapter 13, Section 1401, Number 14. It defines the term existing public safety broadband spectrum as the portion of the electromagnetic spectrum that be between the frequencies of 763 and 799 megahertz. So right now, the law that we say is tying our hands speaks only of the safety of up to, it, it, it defines the range, the spectrum range, up to 700, up to 800 megahertz. Now this, um, uh, this uh, um, 5G, uh, from what I read, Tom Wheeler, the, the chairman of the FCC, said that this would open up uh, the, the 5G would open up vast amounts of high frequency spectrum, and that's from 28 to 100 gigahertz. So this is a quantum, quantum difference in spectrum, in radiation from what that, the current law, which is up to 800 megahertz, says. So is this a way that we can challenge the FCC by saying that, that the, the law itself only applies to spectrum up to 800 megahertz, and what we're asking for and what everybody here is asking for is to equip this for F5G, which will be um, uh, radiation up to 28 to 100 mega gigahertz. So th thank you. So I, I think that the taking in part the, the message that we have from here is that the law is what the law is, but we are not without our power to try to influence it. And as several people noted here, within the county, we have the, the benefit of being home to the National Institutes of Health and the FDA, which regulates devices, and about a third of the people in the FCC live in this county. <laughs> So it is certainly possible for us to try to work with some of those agencies to convene a meeting to discuss some of the newer studies, the things that are out there. Now, whether that ultimately causes a change in the rules, we cannot predict. But it is certainly something that definitely coming from here, I think that it is a fair criticism to say that a lot of the data that the federal agencies cite publicly is old, and it is not looking at some of this new spectrum, and that's certainly something that we can work to do. Thank you. We, you guys, we're out of time. We have to be out of the building at 9. We want to thank you all for coming and remind you that this meeting is going to be broadcast on County Cable Montgomery. It's going to be also available on demand on the council's website. There's a web page that's um, dedicated to small cell antennas. For County Cable Montgomery, I'm Sonia Burke.